Well, Merry Christmas to you. Today is the second day of Christmas. It is the first Sunday of Christmas. As you know, Christmas is not just a day, but a season, a time of festiveness, a time of joy, a time of celebration, a time of giving thanks, a time of laughter, a time of love. This is the time of the world in the history of the world. This particular 12 days, we reflect on the Savior of the world who came in to be like one of us in order to save us. And as we look at today's reading, there's a very important subject that needs to be discussed, to be understood. And that is the incarnation. What is this mystery called the incarnation? We don't have time often to to study this in depth. But it is appropriate that in our lectionary that this passage has been assigned to us on the first Sunday of Christmas to really understand the beauty and marvel at the majesty of who God is. What you will notice that is strikingly absent in today's gospel passage, the beginning of John, is Mary or Joseph or ba- Jesus in a major, or even angels. There's no shepherds. That is intentional. There is no baptism of Jesus in the Gospel of John. All of these things that you find in the other Gospels, in the Synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John already believes you know those stories. He knows that you have heard those tales. Because John is writing later on in history. And now what he wants to do is to go deeper into the person and nature of God. And so what you have here in the first 18 verses of the Gospel of John is the highest Christological claims that anyone could make of Jesus Christ. And so it is high and rich in depth of theology, but not necessarily for the sake of the mind. No, ultimately for the purposes of the heart. And so now I invite you this morning to lead in with your hearts to take these words and understand just the depth of God's richness and the mystery that we have in the incarnation. God became man that man might become God. God became man, that man might become God. That is arguably the single greatest line to understand the purpose and nature of the incarnation. To understand the purpose and nature of Christmas. To understand the purpose and nature Of the Christian faith. God became man. That man. Might become God. Saint Athanasius. In the 4th century. B.C. Forgive me. A.D. Penned these words. In a treatise that he entitled. On the incarnation. As a defense for the person. And nature of Jesus Christ our Lord. And he defended it with his life. All the way to his dying breath. You see, there was a growing view circulating in the late 3rd century and early 4th century. By a bishop named Arius. That Jesus was not co-eternal with the Father. By virtue that Jesus was created by the Father. That Jesus did not pre-exist before all things. That Jesus himself was a created being of the Father. And so Arianism held that the Son is distinct from the Father and subordinate to the Father. By virtue of him being created by the Father. 
The argument was that God created and sent the word, the logos, into the world. And that logos went into the body of this man, Jesus of Nazareth. And so what that did was it made Jesus a quasi-godlike person. At the same time, a quasi-human. And so in Arius' view, what you have in Jesus is like the mythical figures in the ancient world, like Hercules or Achilles. That was very popular in that day. Mythical figures were easy to believe in that world at that time. But Athanasius, who was first a deacon, and later after his bishop passed away, became a bishop of Alexandria, defended the view and vehemently denied this claim that was circulating and growing by the founder, Arius. And he presented this argument to the council of Nicaea in 325. He was hated by many bishops. Something that we take granted for in today's world, in Christianity today, the man, the proponent, the defender of the Christian faith was hated by many, almost exiled. But he defended it, and it became his life project. Life or death, he would defend the incarnation as God became flesh in Jesus Christ. Now this is very important to know. Because outside of a catechism class, where are we going to learn and remember and know these things about who Jesus is? We don't want to mistake the person and nature of Jesus Christ. Not only the person and nature, but his purpose. That Jesus was in fact co-eternal with the Father, not created. This is the uniqueness of Jesus. Fully God and fully man. Now, where did he, Athanasius, get such an idea? The Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1. What you're reading right now is the central verse that Athanasius argued to dispense, to quiet, to suspend the greatest heresy ever proposed in the church. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the Greek, the term Word is the Logos, the agent by which all things were created. Truth, meaning, purpose, reality, was the Logos. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was God, not became God but was God. When? In the beginning. Beginning of what? The beginning of time. You see, John is intentional here with his words. In the beginning. What does that sound like? In the beginning. It sounds very similar to Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning of what? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Who created the heavens and the earth? God did. When did he create? In the beginning. Before time and space, before anything was created, God himself created all things, heaven and earth. And John is purposely using that language right now at the beginning of his gospel to connect Jesus to God and to reveal and to communicate to us that there is a new creation and that new creation is founded in the one God, Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. The Word was not created. The Word was. Jesus was the Word. And Jesus was with God. Now replace Jesus with the word, word. In the beginning was Jesus. And Jesus was with God. And Jesus was God. 
That's what John wants us to do cryptically, to connect the dots, to understand who Jesus is. That Jesus is not just some mere mortal human being, a figure, like one of the great sages or prophets or patriarchs of the old. No, Jesus himself is God incarnate. All things were made through him, John says, just like God created in the garden. And without him was not anything made that was made. In other words, nothing that was made in the beginning was made without him. Him being Jesus. The Logos was the agent by which all things were created. He, Jesus, is unmade. He is not a creation of God. He coexisted with God before the foundations of the earth. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were eternally present before all things. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Where is life founded? Outside of God, in the beginning. Nowhere. Verse 14, And the Word became flesh. God became flesh. Eskenosen in Greek. He pitched his tent. He tabernacled. Like in the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, where God, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, dwelled in the tabernacle. Well, 2,000 years ago, the Word became flesh and tabernacled with His people. And we have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son of God, full of grace and truth. This is the incarnation of God. The enfleshment of God is the proper word. The enfleshment of God. I love that word, enfleshment. That the Creator God would become like one of us. God entered into human history. God entered into the human condition. God entered our flesh. The enfleshment of God is the key to the Christian faith. We have to understand this. We can't just assume we know this. We can't take this for granted. No. This is partly why Athanasius defended it so vehemently. Because it is the one doctrine that is paramount to everything that follows. There are two mysteries in the Christian faith. One is the Trinity, and second is the Incarnation. Now most people view Christianity as a religion of ethics. How to become a good person. Often they see Christianity as one religion of many, but probably argues or offers the greatest way to become a good person. As Flannery O'Connor once put it, to become a person with a heart of gold. Well, that's a derivative of the Christian faith. That's something that happens once you become a Christian, hopefully. To be a good person is an aim. And it's a desire that I think we should all seek to, to fulfill, to accomplish. I hope we can all become good people. But the heart of the matter is not ethics. Christianity is not about ethics fundamentally or at its core. The heart of the matter is a strange claim, an odd one. So, one, so odd that you wouldn't make it up. Everything else is a footnote. That God became one of us out of love. It's the center of the rose window. Everything else revolves around the incarnation. That God would come into human history to be like one of us. But he does this out of love. Now let's go back. God became man that we might become God. Athanasius said. God enters into our humanity. Why? So to lift us up into his divine life. You see, that's what God wants. God doesn't want the separation.
between heaven and earth, between himself and us. So God enters into the world to lift up our humanity to the divine life that we would find in only him. God doesn't turn into a human being. God doesn't cease to be God in heaven and now solely a human being in Jesus Christ. No. Rather, God takes it to himself to... to, to, God takes it to himself a creaturely nature. He becomes a human being so that to use it as his iconic vehicle to reveal to the world who he is and what humanity should look like. That's what God is doing in Jesus Christ. If you want to know who God is, look to Jesus. How does God think? How is God like? Is God an angry God, a vindictive God, a wrathful God? Look to Jesus and your questions will be answered. Who is this God? Often people don't believe in God. And the question shouldn't be, do you believe in God? The question should always be from us to the person who might be the skeptic or the atheist or the agnostic is, well, what God do you believe in? Because I might not agree and believe in the God that you think that we are talking about. I too might join you in denying that God. What God is it that you do not believe in? I might, disagree, I might agree with you. No. God speaks and acts through the icon of the humanity of Jesus. And that's who Jesus is. He's a living icon of the God of heaven on earth. As I've said before, in every ancient temple, you would always find a statue of the God that they worship. Well, if you look at the earth as a temple, there you have now the icon of the God of this temple in Jesus Christ. How beautiful is that? And that we too are made in His image and in His likeness. But because of the fall, we lost that likeness, though we still bear the image. God became man that, might be God, might, that man might become God. And this is the salvific import of that. Salvation, in other words, is grounded in the incarnation. If Jesus is not God, then we are not saved. That's another reason for the incarnation. It's not just to reveal who God is, but it's also for our salvation. And for those at home or those in the pews today who wonder if there's any salvation outside of Jesus Christ, Let me tell you now, no. If you've heard the message of Jesus Christ and you deny it, God have mercy on anyone. Because we can't find any salvation outside of the person of Jesus Christ. We cannot save ourselves. We're all in the same mess, each one of us in this place at home. We're all in this dysfunctional family, sinful humanity. Each one of us in this room today, if we were honest and transparent and shared with others all that takes place in our lives, all that we do, all that we see, all that we say, All that's taking place in our immediate context, in home, in our past, in the present. We will have to be honest and say, we're all dysfunctional. Our marriages, our relationship, our finances, what we do with our bodies, what we do with our eyes, what we do with our hands, what we do with our money, what we do with our mind. If we're honest, we're all dysfunctional. It's like someone caught in an addiction and can't lift themselves out of it. The key here is to admit that, that I cannot, you cannot, 
No one in our lives has the power to help the dysfunction in our lives, fully to uproot it at its core. Do you and I admit that? Have you admitted that? Have I admitted that? Do we admit that regularly? That, Lord, I can't on my own. Only you can. We need a higher power to break into the dysfunctional family to fix it. Think of a toaster, a broken toaster. A broken toaster cannot fix itself. And you can line up a hundred toasters next to it and neither can they. But who can fix it? The only one who can fix that broken toaster is the one who made it. And if there is a watch, there's a watchmaker. If there's a human, there's a human maker. We're all in the same boat. We're all seasick, Chesterton said. No one can solve the problem. No human being, no prophet, no patriarch, no religious figure. No one can fix the problem outside of God. Be it religious, political, whoever. But God. Hence, God becomes man, necessarily. You see why Athanasius defended the incarnation? Not only to explain who Jesus is, but that in Jesus, in Jesus we find our only hope for salvation, for redemption. St. Paul in the Philippians, which was one of the earliest letters written, and chapter 2 of that letter probably dates even before the letter as a hymn, meaning that this was very early on the people believed this, that the Apostle Paul is echoing in chapter 2. Though he was in the form of God, he did not consider equal with God something to be grasped, but rather emptied himself, took on the form of a slave, being born in the likeness of men. And being formed in human form, he humbled himself, obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. God becomes man, entering into our dysfunction, so to remake it and to remake it from the inside. As Anglicans, we say the creed every Sunday. And there's words in there that Athanasius fought vehemently for. In reference to Jesus, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. This is the fight and victory Athanasius had against Arius. And we reclaim that victory every Sunday. Because without that victory, there is no hope for humanity. Jesus necessarily has to be God. Or there's no hope for us. Or Jesus becomes just one of many religious figures throughout time and space. In Jesus, we have fully God, fully man. And the Council of Chalcedon in 451 furthered that in great detail. So I have a question for you this morning as I bring this to an end. Have you received Jesus? Have you received Jesus as God? Because though he came into the world, not all did receive him. He came to his own, but his own did not receive him. Who's his own? The people he created. But to those who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, not born of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. The question I have for you this morning is that is Jesus the Son of God, God incarnate, the enfleshment of God for you? We were made to become children of God. You and I were made to become children of God. 
And the greatest gift, I echo the words of Bishop Keith here, that we can give anyone in this season is the gift of Jesus Christ. Is to reveal to him, to them, what God has revealed to us. As God took it on his flesh, as God took on flesh the Son, may we too take on our flesh the Son. May we reveal to the world that Jesus exists through our lives. That is the greatest gift our loved ones should receive. You believe in God? Okay. Now go and make Jesus known. It's one thing to know Jesus. It's another thing to make him known. God did not keep that mystery to himself, but he revealed it to the world, and he's calling us to do likewise. This morning, I read the news that Archbishop Desmond Tutu passed. Here is a Archbishop of South Africa who ended the apartheid, the slavery that was taking place. Here is a man who lived by the conviction that because God exists, I too have a role in this life. God became man in order that man might become God. In Archbishop Desmond Tutu, he sought to reveal, to become like God, to become like Christ. What about us? Do we keep Jesus here in the pews or with one another as great actors with a mask, a persona? Or are we true to who we are with one another, with those outside this place? I hope the latter. I hope this Christmas season that we would present Jesus to the world. That God in the flesh, for the sake of us, for the sake of the world, came into the world to reveal to us himself plainly and that we would in turn receive him and share him with others. That is the gift of Christmas, the gift from God. Let us pray. Lord, we can't fully understand who you are but you have revealed to us this morning who you became. And that by looking at you, Jesus, in our holy word, we can come to know you. And by knowing you, that we too can be transfigured, changed. Help us change in all the areas of our life that have yet, Lord, that we have yet surrendered to you. And help us, O oh God, in that transformation, reveal you to the world. Help us, O oh Lord, give us the grace to desire such a prayer. To you be the glory. May we live with what we believe. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.